Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guest today is Scott Ritter. And Scott has just uh, published a new book. And, it, and uh, why don't you tell, the, uh, tell us the name of the book? Well, the name of the book is Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika, Arms Control in the End of the Soviet Union. Okay, so why, why is that so important right now? Well, you know, George Santayana, uh, American philosopher, uh, is famously uh, quoted often as uh, saying, uh, those who fail to learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. Uh, but the implication there is that history um, is, it consists only of mistakes, and that if you don't study the mistakes, you're, you're, you're condemned to repeat them. But every once in a while, history gives us a success story. And uh, this book, Sorry in the Time of Perestroika, is a history of one of the greatest successes in, in, in modern history, uh, the success of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the success of the United States and the Soviet Union coming together uh, during a time of great tension and crisis to um, work in a cooperative fashion to rid the world of an entire category of nuclear weapons that were threatening not only Europe, but the, the entire globe with nuclear annihilation. Uh, so, you know, this this book is, um, you know, we, we need to twist Santayana's words. Those who uh, fail to learn the successes of history are condemned to never again have success. Uh, and when we talk about the situation today, I mean, one only has to, you know, reflect on the fact that Russian President Vladimir Putin just gave one of the most um, important speeches of modern history uh, in which Russia incorporated four previously uh, previous the uh, Ukrainian territories and in effect uh, just came very short of declaring war on the West. Um, you know there's talk about Russia using nuclear weapons in Ukraine, Russia using nuclear weapons against NATO, the United States and NATO coming up with a nuclear deterrent strategy uh, for Russia. The potential of all-out nuclear warfare exists today. And you know, people are probably pulling their hair out, saying, "How, how do we get out of this mess? What do we do? Uh, is there any hope?" And I say, "Yes, there is hope, because there was a time back in 1987, 88, when the world, when 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 we had the same issues. You know, in the 1980s, in 1985, the United States was still actively supporting the Mujahideen in Afghanistan for the sole purpose of killing Soviet soldiers." Uh, the United States, the CIA, had carried out a massive sabotage against Russian gas pipelines. Sound familiar? Um, the uh, the Russians had killed, or the Soviets had killed, an American officer in East Germany who was, um, you know, collecting intelligence about uh, uh, Soviet tank movements. Uh, we we almost went to nuclear war twice uh, in 1983, 1984. Um, you know, Abel Archer was a NATO exercise that the Russians misinterpreted as being an actual first strike uh, nuclear uh, attack by, by NATO and they mobilized their missiles in response. And then a, a Russian uh, officer bravely disregarded standing orders uh, when you detect a, a, a nuclear missile launch from the United States to immediately mobilize. He disregarded and said on his own initiative, I think this could be a mistake. It turned out it was a mistake, but had he obeyed his orders, we could have been in, in a nuclear conflict. So things were pretty bad in the 80s. Maybe a lot of people alive today don't remember them, weren't around back then. I was. Um, I played a role in not only preparing for nuclear war with Russia in the 1980s, but I was literally the first inspector on the ground in the Soviet Union to implement the INF Treaty. Uh, that was this wonderful moment in time. This I, I call it a Camelot-like moment where everybody came together working in harmony towards you know, a, a common objective, which was uh, to find a way to decrease the nuclear threat and find a way to live in, um, you know, in peaceful coexistence. So this book is a, a history of that time. Uh, it's, it's a history that's never been written. Nothing has ever been written like this book before. I'll just straight up and say bragging that uh, there are sources used in this book that nobody else has access to, nobody's uh, tapped into. Um, it's it's unique in every sense of the way. Um, I, I think it's an engaging story. It's it's told from my perspective primarily, um, but it's but it's also a broader explanation of the inspection process. 
and you know disarmament in the time of perestroika. It's also a history of perestroika. When I first arrived in the Soviet Union in June of 1988, Mikhail Gorbachev, the man who signed the INF Treaty with Ronald Reagan on, in December of, uh, of 1988, by the way, this December will be the 35th anniversary of the signing of the INF Treaty. Um, the uh, Gorbachev had convened something called the 19th All-Party Union Conference. Now, for a lot of Americans, you're just going to roll your eyes and go, oh, that just sounds like a whole bunch of Soviet uh, bureaucratic uh, terminology. And you're right, except that this was literally an extraordinary conference. The last one had been uh, called in June of 1941, right before the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. It's a big deal. And it was a revolution. It was basically Gorbachev um, attempting to use the policies of perestroika to engender a revolution in, in the way the Soviet Union governed itself, to do away with the old Soviet uh, Communist Party a hold on power to create a more democratic, uh, you know, rep representative government, uh, an election for the Congress of People's Deputies, etc. And this was a process that was going on while I was there. I watched it on TV. I watched people debate it. And for the entire time that we were building this inspection uh, presence in the Soviet Union outside of a Soviet missile factory, imagine that. 30 Americans building a permanent site outside a Soviet missile factory where we lived and worked. Uh, together with Soviets um, in an area of the Soviet Union that had been closed for decades to any foreigners. We were the first for foreigners to step on that soil. Most of the people who lived there had never seen a foreigner before in Vatkensk. And so suddenly 30 Americans show up and they're all like, what the heck is going on here? Um, but it's a story of, 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 of how perestroika, the hope of perestroika and ultimately the failure of perestroika told not only from the observations of the inspectors, but I had access to the newspaper, uh, the, the local newspaper, Leninsky Put, uh, Lenin's Way, local Communist Party newspaper, Udmurtskaya Pravda. The Udmurt, uh, Udmurtia was the republic that we uh, that, that the Vodkensky city we're at was in. Udmurtskaya Pravda, Communist Party paper. You know, in 1987, uh, these were faithful tools of communist propaganda. But by 1988, they've been transformed by Glasnost, the policy of openness, into actually having some of the most um, uh, opinionated investigative journalism imaginable. These people were digging deep into perestroika, into the problems of communism, into the daily lives. Uh, and it was laid out for everybody to read. And we inspectors read it, and we absorbed it, and then we watched it. And so that experience is also brought in. So it's, it's a parallel history of the inspection process, disarmament process, but also perestroika and how the two work together. And ultimately, disarmament led to the fall of the Soviet Union. The role of defense industry producing these missiles in the Soviet economy um, was immense. Most Americans aren't aware of it. And I explain it in the book how this factory that produced missiles was actually you know, the, the lifeblood of the city. The city was a factory town. Nothing happened unless the factory allocated the resources. And when we signed the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, we got rid of three of the five missile systems that were produced by this factory, the SS-20, the SS-12, the SS-23. That's, that's like telling Ford, a Ford automobile plant that produces five different kinds of cars, you're only going to produce two kinds of cars now. The other three are going away. And they're saying, well, how do we earn money? Uh, and then if you have a city like Detroit that's totally dependent upon the factory, how do we keep the city functioning? A legitimate question. And then as the disarmament process went on, one of the two remaining missiles that were produced, it's called the Courier missile or the short ICBM, was put on the chopping block by Gorbachev. And the to and fro about what would happen to this missile, would it be allowed to be produced, would it not be allowed to be produced, et cetera, finally ended with Gorbachev in August of uh, 1991, signing a decree to terminate the, the, the development of this missile. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. When he signed that, it was presented to Soviet defense officials. And that's when they met with Khrushchev in a bathhouse in Moscow to plot the coup against Gorbachev in, in, in 1991. So arms control was directly related to the fall of the Soviet Union. It's all captured in this book. The story has never been told before. So it's not just a fascinating history but it's also a template of success, meaning there was a way 
that there was a time when the United States and the Soviet Union could work together towards the mutual benefit of both parties. And, and this book provides that template, a template of hope. So what, what made you decide to write it? Well, everybody, the interesting thing is that everybody who participated in this knew from, from the day one, we were, we were on step foot on, on the Soviet, that we were involved in something bigger than this. We were involved in one of the most remarkable historical events of, of our age. Um, we, we were writing the book on on-site inspection. You know, today it's sort of a given that we send inspectors abroad to inspect things. But back in the 1980s, uh, especially when you're dealing with arms control between the Soviet Union and the United States, no, nobody wanted inspectors on their ground. We didn't want Soviets prowling around our, our uh, military bases, and they didn't want Americans prowling around theirs. Uh, but the INF Treaty recognized that if we were going to disarm these missiles in a reciprocal fashion, that you had to have a, verifica a compliance verification mechanism that was more capable than just simply taking photographs of satellites. Satellites can be spoofed. Inspectors can't be spoofed. Inspectors have eyeballs attached to brains, have ears attached to brains. We see and hear, and uh, we go in. So it had never been done before. So we were writing the book on on-site inspection. Uh, this was a huge historical moment. We were breaking the ground in, in terms of Soviet-U.S. relationships. This was a big deal. It really was. And um, everybody knew that, that we were making history. And when you make history, sometimes you wait for people to write the history. I mean, you know, especially if you're a participant, you sort of sit back afterwards and drink your beer and smoke your cigar and say, okay, historians, go at it. Um, nobody's ever written this. Why? One of the reasons is that the treaty forbade uh, anybody, uh, uh, any any side, using information derived from the treaty um, in an unauthorized fashion. So it was pretty much impossible to write a definitive history because the material, even though it wasn't secret, was protected by the treaty. Um, and so it was impossible to write this book. But it was frustrating as somebody who played an important role in this. You know, as as you go in ten years, twenty years, thirty years, to to realize that. Um, the world's losing, you know, losing memory about this important event. People weren't, weren't, weren't remembering how important it was. And by forgetting the history, remember Santayana, those who, are, who fail to learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. And I'm just watching, saying, you guys are you're making the same mistakes today that you made back then. Why don't you remember what we did? But I couldn't write about it. Then Donald Trump withdrew from the INF Treaty and... Um, in August of 2019, the Soviets or the Russians followed thereafter. There was no more treaty. And since there was no more treaty, there was no more restraint. And I said, if there's ever going to be a hope to resurrect this treaty, to breathe life, because this treaty is so important. Europe, without an INF treaty, Europe will self-destruct in, into a sea of nuclear oblivion. And we see that today playing out in front of us in, in Europe today. We're on the edge of a nuclear war because there is no INF treaty in place to put down these, uh, you know, these, these passions. And I said, if we're ever going to be able to resurrect this treaty, um, people have to know the truth. People have to know the history. So I started to write that book in 2019. It's a, it's, it's a very difficult story to uh, tell for the, for the lay person. Um, the book went through numerous drafts, uh, you know, trying to explain uh, to people what cargo scan is, a giant um, x-ray device that was installed outside the factory that would x-ray missiles inside a rail car, you know, and explain the technology. You know, it sounds exciting the way I'm telling it, but if I'm going to tell it the, the way it really is, people are just going to fall asleep. It's, it's just full of technical mumbo jumbo. So how do you tell that story in a way that um, is, is informative, factually accurate, but also uh, people is approachable. And, and so I also had to, I had to make a decision, you know, do I tell this as a dispassionate historian or do I tell it the way I lived it? As a guy who was there doing this. And mm -hmm. so I made the decision that this was going to be a personal journal, that I was going to put myself into the story and, and, and explain explain to people what these things are as I learned about it. You know, I was not, when I went into this, I was a Marine Corps first lieutenant. 
that's about that's very low on the totem pole. There's only one thing lower than a first lieutenant. That's a second lieutenant. I had just made first lieutenant, uh, and they put me into this environment where most of the people were majors, lieutenant colonels, and colonels. Um, I was uh, literally, I, 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 I was a fish out of water. I was the wrong person for the job, uh, and yet I ended up playing a central role in this. And the entire my entire experience was a was a, a journey of discovery. Everything to me was new. Um, going to the Soviet Union, learning about cargo scan technology, learning about infrared measuring devices, learning about missiles. What the heck does a Marine know about missiles? Not a damn thing, excuse my language. And suddenly I'm responsible for monitoring the production of these missiles and making uh, conclusions. You know, But I was an intelligence officer and I was trained and I was pretty good at my job. And you know, not to not not to brag, but uh, I explain in the book. I I managed uh, being this very junior person to um, end up getting two classified commendations from the director of the CIA. Uh, unprecedented, never had happened before. Um, and I was singled out for recognition because um, I was a quick learner and um, I, I I played an important role in this. Um, you know, you can't say any one person did everything. There's that old you know theory of the bucket of water, take your hand out of a bucket of water and how much of a hole does it leave? None. But I can say, along with all the other players that were in there, uh, we were actually the exceptions to that rule. Each one of us with our hand in the bucket, if we pulled our hand out, there would be a hole because every person played a unique role that could not be replaced by anybody else. It was a, a the luck of the draw. I mean, we're talking about pure serendipity that somehow we were able to bring together the people we brought together at that time and place to do the job. Had it been a different mix of people, we might not have succeeded, um, but we did succeed. Why? Because of people, the book is dedicated to two people. One is uh, George Murdoch Connell, Colonel, United States Marine Corps. He's my mentor, my friend. Um, unfortunately, he passed. But you know this. This is a living legend. A Marine's Marine, Silver Star winner in Vietnam, um, was was a attaché in Moscow. Um, did some legendary intelligence work in the Cold War. Uh, he was one of the guys picked to uh, to command Vodkinsk on a rotational basis. The other one was a guy named um, Douglas Mars England, an Army Colonel. Uh, again, Vietnam veteran, um, a man who proved his. Uh, his, not only his skills as an attaché in Moscow, but his heroism. The, when the embassy caught on fire in the 19 in the late 1970s, uh, England ran in uh, and protected the classified material. Uh, he escorted uh, Soviet firefighters, half of whom were KGB officers. Uh, he escorted them to make sure they only fought the fire; they didn't steal the secrets. And for that, he was given the highest award for heroism in a non-combat fire. These are two mountain of men. These are two lions. Um, and they're two, two totally different people. Uh, Connell, he's a Marine, very energetic, very forceful. England, he was a little more, more laconic. He was more laid back and they rotated out. So imagine being on the ground in Vodkansk working for both men. And for three weeks, you've got this Marine who's running around and everything's energy, 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 energy. And then suddenly you got three weeks of this very laid back guy. It was like going from fire to ice to fire and ice, but it worked because the two personalities were actually what was needed to resolve. Had we had continuity of command, um, we might not have succeeded because the continuity of command leads to a sort of a, a solidification of problems. But, and we had many problems. No, a lot of people didn't want this experiment in arms control to work, including a senator named Jesse Helms, a powerful Republican on the Foreign Relations Committee, hated the INF Treaty, and he was inspiring to undermine it. And I tell that story throughout how Jesse Helms continued to get intelligence information, then cherry pick it in a way that made the Soviets look bad, and then release it to the press to undermine the inspections at critical times. And then the Soviets would read this in the press. And they'd come to us and say, what's going on here? How come you're accusing us of this, that, and the other thing? And it was destroying relationships and undermining confidence in the treaty. Um, so had we had continuity of, uh, of command, Jesse Helms might have succeeded because these problems would have 
you know, they, the, the problems would have continuity as well. But because we were shaking things up with these two different leaders, you know, one leader would approach it this way and the Soviets would draw their battle lines and then the next leader would come in and the Soviets would have to change their battle lines. And in the process, we'd have dialogue and discussion. And next thing you know, we've resolved the problems. And that's the beauty of it. If Washington, D.C. and Moscow had been left to resolve half these problems, the treaty would have failed. But because, let me tell you a little insight on this treaty. Um, the treaty was only supposed to be originally um, straight inspections, meaning the Soviets declare a site, we declare a site, send inspectors to the sites, they inspect what's in the site, they oversee the destruction of the material, then they inspect to make sure that everything's destroyed, nothing comes up again. Great. But then in November, of, the treaty was supposed to be signed in December. In November, at the last second, the Soviets said, yeah, we got a problem, guys. Um, that missile we're getting rid of, the SS-20, the first stage of the SS-20 is virtually identical to the first stage of the SS-25 missile, which means from a compliance verification thing, the Soviets could theoretically be producing SS-20 missiles disguised as SS-25s, and we'd have no way of knowing. So how do we deal with that? Well, now we have to put a team on the ground at the at the factory. Wait, the treaty is going to be signed in a month. How do we figure this one out? Well, we we had planned this back in the eighties, a way of intimidating the Russians away from uh, keeping SS twenty missiles. We said, if you're going to keep SS twenty missiles, we have to inspect the factory. And we came up with this perimeter portal monitoring scheme where we put a permanent facility outside, et cetera, et cetera. And the Russians looked at that and went, No, 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 no. Too complicated, too intrusive. We don't want to do it. But now they had no choice but to take it. So now we're going to put inspectors outside the factory, but there's no protocol written. There's nothing written. They just said, we're going to do it. We have to put it into the treaty, but we'll figure out how it's going to be done later. But between the time the treaty was signed in December and the time that the treaty was going to be implemented in July, nobody figured it out. So what they told the inspectors is, in addition to building this facility from scratch, nothing's there you got to make it work. It's up to you to make it work with your Soviets. So we had to work with our Soviet counterparts to resolve every single problem. And there were a myriad of problems. We made it work, Cynthia. We made it work. We made it work in the hot sun of the summer. We made it work in the mud of the fall. We made it work in minus 50 degree temperature. Oh, right. the we made it work. And it was the collective effort of Americans and Soviets working together um, and that's why I wrote this book, because it's a story that had to be told, had to be told. And I'm proud to have been a part of it. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to write the book. And I would strongly encourage people to read it. Again, not just because of the history, but because we live in a time where we need this kind of activity today to save humanity. So how can people get the book? Well, the book can be bought um, on, you, know, you can go to the website. Clarity Press is the uh, publisher, so you can go to the Clarity Press a website, right? You can buy it on Barnes and Nobles. You can buy it on Amazon. But here's the other thing you can do. You can go to your local bookseller. And if enough people go to the local bookseller, because the book right now is in warehouses. Distributor has warehouses where they put. But the books aren't coming on the shelves because nobody's asking for the book. But if people go to the bookseller and say, hey, can I, can you give me Disarm in the Time of Perestroika? If enough people ask the bookseller about the book, the bookseller will order the books from the warehouse, put them on the shelves, and it'll be you know that much more accessible. So if you live in the Albany area, go to Barnes and Nobles and ask them for the book. Go to the uh, to the to the, the bookstore in uh, Stuyvesant Plaza. Bookhouse. Go to, uh, go to Bookhouse. Go to uh, I Love Books in Del Mar. Go to any local bookstore and just say, uh, can you can you uh, give me a copy of uh, Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika? And if enough people ask, they'll stock the books with it, and that'll help get the uh, get the word out. Terrific, Scott. Uh, and believe it or not, our time is just about up. So we will talk again next week, and we'll talk about what's going on with the conflict between the the West and the uh, and Russia. So you've been listening to Scott Ritter. This is Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler, and if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube page, my YouTube channel. Thanks, Scott. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great day.